The information provided on lifeinterruptedradio.com is for educational purposes only. Welcome everyone to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. And as always, it's my honor and pleasure to be with you here on another Friday night for a brand new episode. And I'm just about to burst a bubble. I am so excited. Have you ever had a bucket list and you were able to fulfill it twice in just a matter of a few months? (laughs) That's what's happened to me. A while ago, I attended Dan Millman's workshop and I was so impressed. I'd read his book in the mid 80s and it changed my life. His first book, he's the author of 17 books, but let me talk about the first book for just a second, Wave the Peaceful Warrior. It changed my life. And after reading the book, I just like, I'd really like to know more about what this guy thinks and learn more from his wisdom. And I had the opportunity, a couple, as I said, a few months ago, and uh, just had an amazing time, came back with just a notebook full of questions. And he's been kind enough to be on the show tonight. And so let me give him a quick bio. Dan Millman is a former world champion athlete, university coach, martial arts instructor, and college professor. After an intensive 20-year spiritual quest, Dan's teachings found its form as Peaceful Warrior's Way, as expressed fully in his books and lectures, and he continues to evolve over time to meet the needs of the changing world. Dan's 17 books, including Way of the Peaceful Warrior, have inspired and informed millions of readers in 29 languages. And maybe you're familiar with Peaceful Warrior, a movie adaptation starring Nick Nolte based on his first book. We'll get into more of his amazing bio, but I want to make sure we have as much time as possible. And thank you, Dan, for being on the show. I am just so honored to have you here. Uh, I'm glad to be here with you, Sharon, and sharing with your listeners. Oh, my gosh. You know, my time at your workshop radically changed my viewpoints in so many ways. One thing I want to say I appreciate about you after spending some time with you was you are what I call a lifelong learner. And I just so appreciated how you would express like, this is what I used to believe and this is how it transformed and showing us that we can change. And one of the things, quotes you have, I have written in my book is, don't strive for success, strive for excellence. And I just have to say that changed my viewpoint of healing from autoimmune as well. (laughs) I started to think about optimizing for sure, instead of that big, great big word cure. So I just have all sorts of insights like that, but I'm getting ahead of myself. First, tell the audience, if they're not familiar with your spiritual quest, what started you on the path? Sure. I'd like to say first that I believe every human soul is on a spiritual quest, uh, looking for meaning, uh, connection, fulfillment. Um, But some of us, it's more conscious, this quest, and others, not not so quite yet. Uh, My own quest... Uh, was a process of disillusion, actually. I, I was successful in the field of sport and gymnastics, um, but I realized it didn't lead to any lasting uh, uh, fulfillment that I might have hoped. Um, everything was temporary, and, and I began to see that and understand it and realize, I, I guess, one of these basic Buddhist teachings, everything is temporary. Um, so I tried this and I tried that, and I began a search, um, uh, first in the realm of sport, and then as my interest expanded into the larger arena of everyday life, I stumbled upon, if you will, uh, various mentors and influences, and I was so excited about these. I'm actually writing about them in a new book, which may be my final 18th and final book, a memoir uh, about these four mentors and how they represent the spiritual search, the search for happiness, healing, health, fulfillment, and so on. And so it took me through these experiences and I realized I wanted to share in a way people could get at a heart level, at a gut level, not just conceptual. So that's what eventually led to Way of the Peaceful Warrior. Um, And it led me to search for how to create more talent for sport into how can we create more talent for just living, relationships, health, finances, uh, all the events and challenges of everyday life. And, and that, that uh, I finally found an approach to living that I won't go into any depth about how this term came up. It, it wasn't just some strategic idea of thinking of a brand, uh, but 
it was from the realization that we're all peaceful warriors in training. Everyone I know wants to live with a more peaceful heart, but there are times we need a warrior's spirit just to face the challenges of daily life. So that idea of peaceful heart, warrior spirit uh, became this approach to living that I call the peaceful warrior's way. And that's what I've been doing for the last 40 years or so. Oh my gosh. And been transforming so many lives in the process. Thank you for, thank you for having the quest. It's been an awesome one to watch from afar, reading your books and, and then having the opportunity to spend some time with you as well. One of the things that, as I said, really changed my life during the workshop was your approach to taking action. So many times I've been to events and workshops and trainings and types of things, and it was all very good and rah-rah, and you left feeling rah-rah, but I so appreciated you teaching exact skills about taking action. Let's talk a little bit about how, I'm trying to remember the quote you had, something about the effect that really, all, you can do all the learning, but if you don't take action, it doesn't really matter. Right. A French person, a poet named Duguay said, the, the, the smallest good deed surpasses the greatest grand intention. Thinking about something is the same as not doing it. So, but it's not as if uh, it's some sort of a frenzied approach to just act, 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 do this, do that. It's more a recognition of how reality actually works. You know, today we hear all about fake news and fake this and fake that. And, and people, unfortunately, because science is changing, they have one conclusion and a new study shows something different. But they're open-minded, always exploring and trying to find the laws of reality. You know, scientists and mystics are on the same search. They want to find the laws of reality. They just have different methods of investigation. And so I came to realize, working with these various mentors, that we have more control over what we actually do, how we move our arms and legs and what we say, even though our mouth doesn't always feel under our control. Uh, generally, we, we can control that. And we have more control over what we do, how we act, how we behave, than we do over what thoughts, positive or negative, happen to appear in our awareness and pop up in the discursive mind. We have more control over what we do than what emotions pass through us, like the weather, the changing weather. We can't just will ourselves to feel differently than we do in any given moment. Feelings change all the time, and there are many ways to influence how we feel, to feel differently, look at things from a different angle, to take a deep breath, to relax. All these things may influence how we feel, but to control it, just to say, I want to feel different now, oh, wouldn't that be a great talent if we could actually do it? <laughs> but so many books, Sharon, as, as you know, so many books and teachings are about just change your thoughts to change your life, think positively, and feel grateful and feel happy and peaceful and strong and confident. Well, that's wonderful. I'm, I'm all in favor of positive feelings and thoughts when they happen, when you consider the alternative. But I came to realize they're not in our direct control. We can't will ourselves just to feel or think differently. So I came to peace with my mind. I tamed my mind, not by trying to quiet it, but by allowing it to do its thing and not let it push me around so much. And that's the purpose of meditation. We get some distance from these arising thoughts. We just kind of see them rather than have them take over and mistake them for reality. You know, Mark Twain once said, I've had many troubles in my life, most of which never happened. I love that quote. <laughs> yeah, most of our troubles are from the past or future, from our imagination or memory. What's right in front of us, we can generally handle. So, that's why I emphasize action, simply because we have more control over what we do. We can ask someone out and meet someone and say something that's a little scary, even if we're feeling afraid or underconfident. Those feelings don't have to determine how we behave. And this is a real form of liberation. And so whether we're feeling confident, whether our thoughts are positive or negative, we can still say, okay, what do I need to do now? And, and that's that's what I mean for your listeners, as you understand, when I say the focus on the peaceful warrior's way is about action rather than fixing our thoughts and feelings so we can finally live well. And I could apply that to my own healing journey from autoimmune. As I thought about sometimes the own 
depth of thoughts and feelings can be a little overwhelming when you're given diagnosis and you're hearing things from stats and white coat authority, as I say in air quotes, it can be a little overwhelming. And I really appreciated learning this idea of taking action. And part of what amazed me was as I took action, my thoughts and feelings changed. I began to realize I had more control <laughs> over a lot of things in the healing journey. And that was so profound to me. That's one of the messages I wanted the audience to know about this idea of taking action. Another one that we did, it's around action in a way, a little tangential, is where we did a break the board opportunity mm -hmm. from martial arts. Mm -hmm. And I loved the way you taught us because I hadn't ever considered it in this format. What happened to me, guys, was I came up to the board and there's Dan and he's helping us guide us through how we're going to break the board with the palm of our hand. And he's given us great instruction and all of that. And two things that I remember so clearly that he said, that force is applied only at the moment of contact. And then as I began to go through the process of, I'll say, ramping up the force to make that moment of contact, he said to me, hit the blanket. Now, let me describe what I'm saying by that, because underneath the board, who's set up on some blocks, was a blanket to protect our hands from the floor or to protect the floor from our hands, who knows? But <laughs> what I loved about that was it told me, don't stop at that action of the board, keep going. And when I hit the blanket, that was like, the next, the next place I was supposed to be. And I have applied that idea of not just getting to that next step, but actually then what is beyond, right beyond that, like hit the blanket. I keep telling myself every time I set a goal. Yes, there is a saying that obstacles appear when we lose sight of our goal. So many times we focus on the problem, we focus on the problem and the, the board, the board. So the board is a metaphor. And yes, it does take, you know, skill and spirit to break that board. As you know, it's not an easy thing to do. Going and aiming through the board rather than to it. The board represents self-doubt. The board represents insecurity. The board represents whatever we need to break through to our goals. And, you know, when I said, I said, you only need the force, the power in the moment you need it. It doesn't matter who wins the warm up, as the saying goes. It's in the moment of truth. That's when you need it. That's when you can bring it to bear. And so in the moment you break through that board, it, all the lessons come through and you embody them. You don't just think about them, conceptualize and say, oh, I understand, Dan. No. Nope doing is understanding. And so you did it and you definitely understood. So that was the purpose of that particular exercise. And I do that in many of my weekend workshops and so on. Uh, it, it, people seem to enjoy it. You know, you mentioned autoimmune and healing. Maybe this is an object lesson for your listeners. I had a back issue in my lower back. Many people do, but mine, you know, I shattered my right thigh bone into, in 40 pieces when I was 21 years old in a motorcycle crash. And it caused an imbalance in my body. My leg was a bit shorter and turned outward and so on. And I had to heal from that. It took a while, but I did recover to a large degree. But uh, years later, I had this stenosis of bony growth in my lower spine. Well, we didn't know what it was. I went to many doctors and one surgeon who specialized in diagnosis looked at the MRI and the x-rays and he said, okay, you need five-step procedure, including fusion and foreignostomy and this and this and this and this, and you have to do all of them or it won't work. And I shook his hand and said, well, it was very nice meeting you, Doc. And I got out of there as quick as I could. And then after getting that really good diagnosis from an authority figure, I found the right person. He was a very gifted neurosurgeon. And he said, well, what you have is this. He diagnosed it properly and said, 45-minute surgery, um, local anesthetic, and that should take care of it. And he went in and I was 20 years younger, 45 minutes later. Um, and wow. I've never had a back issue since then. So the point is finding the right person, get second opinions, third opinions. Um, and, you know, each of us has the ability to heal. Sometimes not. I have a friend who had a motorcycle crash and he's paralyzed. He's a paraplegic and he did everything he could to recover. Get the, And there's new technologies happening all the time that can help us with that. But at some point, 
we can learn to accept where we are if we've done everything we can to get better and to relieve the pain, the discomfort, the imbalance. But it's not a failure. In fact, the challenge is we become different people, more compassionate, more understanding. I so empathize with people when I see they're in some discomfort now. I know what that's like. It, it creates a different quality person, actually. Not that we have to seek that out. I don't recommend fractures as a method of personal development. So I wanted to just offer that reminder and, and share that experience for your listeners. Oh, that's fantastic. And it brought to mind a couple of things. When I was recommended a, a surgery that might have alleviated the current condition, but in my mind went, mm, that will change my life drastically in the long run. And I sought out a second opinion. And he said to me, Sharon, that's a surgeon's answer for a problem he cannot solve. We will mm -hmm. seek out other answers. Mm -hmm. And I use that in my life so many ways now. If someone gives me an answer and I'm like, hmm, intuitively that's maybe right for you, but just isn't sitting with me. I would, hmm, so that's an accountant's answer or <laughs> that's a doctor's answer for a problem he can't solve. How else can I solve it is what, where my mind always goes with that. I appreciate that so much. You couldn't be more right about things that change our life, such as back issue in your case, autoimmune in my case, about I'm a much more compassionate and nicer person. I'm, I move and expect things and at a slower pace now. I just let it, I'm here for the flow, here for the yes. flow. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, you know, I, one of the founding principles of this approach to living I call the Peaceful Warrior's Way, which is again about all of us, is that there is no best teacher doctor, healing method, book, religion, uh, philosophy, diet, exercise system. There's only the best for each of us at a given time of our life. Life is an experiment. We have to find out what works best for us. So that's why I tell people, I'm not here for you to trust me. I'm here to help you trust yourself and the process of your life unfolding. So I thought I'd, I'd just offer that observation as well. Oh, and it's true. One thing that I enjoyed about our time together was I was walking away with these little, I'll call them sound bites, but which isn't quite fair, but I, I think it's how my mind operates, like hit the blanket and some of the other things I learned mm -hmm. about here and now and breathe and relax, those types of things, which we'll get into in just a minute. And Dan, I am just enjoying our talk about this idea of trusting ourselves. It is so hard sometimes when you're sitting there in an office, a medical office can be intimidating in itself, and in walks a white coat authority, and they'll use words like you have, and stats are, or this is what's going to happen to you, without really thinking about the long-term consequences <laughs> of how that can influence our feelings and our thoughts about getting well. What are some things you've learned through the process to help people be able to say, thank you, and? Well, you know that saying that the, the Arabs have a saying, trust in God or trust in Allah, but tie your camel. Uh, in other words, Cardinal Spellman, the cleric, once said, pray as if everything depends on God and work as if everything depends on you. So as it has been said before, we live in a sort of a co-creative process. To underscore that point, once more, a very quick story. A fellow named Irving used to pray every day. He would go to, in his case, the synagogue, but he would pray every day to, to win the lottery. And he said, look, I've been a good man, Lord. I've been, I've been kind. I have a family. I've taken care of my kids. I work hard. Please, just once could I win the lottery. I've been, every, I've been for so long, I've been hoping. And, and he kept asking over and over. And finally, the clouds parted and a voice thundered down and said, Irving, he said, will you go halfway with me and buy a ticket? <laughs> and, and, and so it's not just about praying and waiting and hoping and wishing. It's about what can we do? We do everything we can to improve a situation, whether it's our physical health, our finances. And if we keep going, eventually we have some breakthroughs. If nothing else, we learn a lot about ourselves and our lives that we might not have learned. And many people will nod and say, yes, I've learned a lot. And of course we want to feel better, get out of pain, whether it's mental pain, emotional, physical. So 
I think it's do what you can, but yes, as you, as you point out, don't identify with the illness or diagnosis because we sometimes say my disease, I have this. And rather than, yeah, there's a condition I'm dealing with and then finding ways there's a, there's a workaround. There's something we can do to improve it. You know, I, I had knee pains for years now I'm, t- I'm 73 years old now. So part of the result of the motorcycle crash years ago, I ended up in 2017, I got a right knee replacement and seven weeks later, a left hip replacement. And I did the rehabilitation. I went through the discomfort. The knee was really tough, but now full range of motion. I can walk for miles and miles and bike, but I did the work. So we have to do what we can do. I also found the best surgeon around I could who took Medicare. (laughs) I'm very grateful. The best hospital in the area. So I did what I needed to do, and the rest I relied on the the skills of others, because none of us are in this alone. Nobody's smarter than all of us. So again, I'm sharing something from my own life uh, about going through some difficulties and discomfort. It took a while. It was a process, getting shots and injections and this and that, but finally... It resolved itself well. Not everything necessarily will fully resolve itself. Often we want to go back to just where we were, but sometimes we have a new life. I I have a relative who ended up with a neurological disease, and he's had quite a challenge with that, and it it gets worse over time, but he's doing what he can to make it less worse. But meanwhile, he's finding his way into a profession. He's a young person, and with the disappointment, that naturally goes with that. He had to give up the sport he loved and other things, but he's finding a different life. And it's as if it was scripted. What if we knew what the screenplay of our life would be beforehand? We say, oh gosh, when I'm this age, this is going to happen. And I'll have to find a new approach to living. You see, the Buddhists say that comparison is a form of suffering. The moment we compare ourselves to someone else, we're, this is a profound disrespect for our own life, our own process unfolding because we're not here to be like somebody else. We're here to be ourselves. Some of us compare ourselves to our younger selves. Oh, when I was young, I used to be able to do this and I used to be able to do that. And that's another form of suffering. Here we are right now. And the key for us is to make the best of that. Even as we strive to improve and grow heal it however we can. Hmm. Oh my gosh. A couple of things came up for me. I just want to tattle on myself to my Courage Club members a little bit. We all know how I am a word nerd and very much identify with what Dan said about not identifying with your condition. And uh, someone caught me on it the other day and I so appreciated them doing that. Having friends like that in your world that call you out on when you identify with it. I'm very careful about talking about the condition or the autoimmune journey, words like that. And then she happened to lovingly call me out on when I identified with my allergy. And I just went, well, okay. I just appreciated having someone in my world that had the loving compassion to call me out on something that they knew that I would really want to be aware that I was doing unconsciously. So I want to- Beautiful. Give her a big kudos. Thank you for that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you are so right about comparison is a form of suffering. The more I thought about that, you shared that in the workshop too. It was so true. And I also wanted to talk about, can we throw things like expectations into comparison? Sure. I think we can. Somebody once said our lives are shaped not so much by our experiences, by our expectations. In fact, one of the laws in one of my books called The Laws of Spirit is the law of expectation. Um, But more recently, I've come to the fact that rather than have high expectations or low expectations, um, there is some benefit in having no expectations and just saying, well, let's see what happens. I mean, I never expected ever to be a world champion on the trampoline, but I never expected I wouldn't either. I just bounced because I loved it and I trained and I practiced and I, it was more, let's see what happens. And I had one very good day, a few good moments. That's all it took. You know, it's like breaking that board. It didn't take days. It just took that one moment of good fortune. Um, 
You know, the, the old cliche, luck happens when preparation meets opportunity. And it all came together. But again, not because I expected it or I had to talk to myself or do affirmations necessarily. I just um, trained and, and, well, to put it another way, uh, you already cited, and I really appreciate being cited that, you know, don't strive for success because that's not in our control. We can't control whether we sink a putt, make a basket, find love, or, or succeed in business. But by making a good effort over time, we really increase the odds of success over not making the effort. In other words, we make 0% of the shots we don't take. So that's a realistic principle by making a good effort. Effort is success because that's all we can control. By striving for excellence, um, quality in the moment, that's the best thing we can do. And the rest we have to kind of let go and see what happens. And that comment that you made in the workshop that I cited uh, from my marvelous little journal here that I read often, it changed my view of the healing process. I had long ago said, doesn't really matter. I just want to feel better, whether they want to, authority wants to label me with the word cure or not. That didn't really matter. But I was still thinking in the long term. And as I began to put that into practice, I began to talk about and think about this idea of I'm just going to optimize each time I do something. How can I do it? a step or two better? How can I optimize what I'm doing each time? And just since our meeting a few months ago, I have been amazed by this principle of just incremental optimization, where you get over time just because of the compounding effect of it. We want to give our body the best shot it has. The body has its own healing powers. We want to sustain it, support it. It's a little much to get into now how the subconscious works. Uh, in the Hawaiian Huna tradition, there's a thing called the basic self, which is in charge of the body. And the more we can appeal to that, the better healing we can, we can get. And what I often recommend to people, as you know, in terms of health and wellness, I'm not a wellness expert. I'm not a financial expert. But understanding spiritual law, universal principles, gains, gives us insight into whatever area, whether it's healing, relationships, finances. So I often recommend three things to people to optimize our genetic potential, whether our parents lived a long time or not as long, whether they had some illness or, or problem or whether they didn't. We know that genes can be turned on or off. They can be triggered or not by what we do, how we live. So we have wiggle room. And so I recommend three things to people, and they're very basic, and we can apply them in our own way. But the first is doing, staying active, doing regular, moderate exercise almost every day. That can be going for a walk. It can be going to a gym or yoga class, too, or swimming. But it's finding what works for us, not what someone else tells us we should do. But moderate, balanced exercise almost every day. Sustainable. It's not something we hate getting up in the morning to do. Although some of us remember that exercise fitness guru, Jack LaLanne. And Jack, <laughs> Jack used to say, I worked out with him once at Santa Monica Beach in California. And Jack would say, I hate to exercise, but I love the results. And so even he didn't necessarily always like it. So it's just balanced, moderate exercise. The second part is finding a balanced diet. Now, I didn't say vegetarian, vegan, gluten-free, grown in season, locally grown, macrobiotic, uh, and all that stuff. I, I happen to be vegetarian. Uh, that works for me, but not necessarily for everyone. The point is finding what works for us. And people say, well, what diet should I practice? I say, eat a little more of what's good for you and gives you energy and a little less of what's not. It's not some perfect diet or scheme. I, I don't believe in imposing a philosophy on uh, our body. We need to find out what works for the body. And the third part is enough rest, just sufficient rest. Some people need more sleep. Some people need less sleep. Find out. Take a power nap if it works for you in the day. If it doesn't, don't. But so those three things, if we just do those over time, it helps our body to do whatever it can do. Absolutely. Um, those are part of the things that I've learned in this healing journey that have gotten me beyond what I was labeled I could do. So I, I appreciate those. I also worked very 
diligently and still do, I guess maybe that's going to be sound kind of odd when I say it, but to manage stress, to be able to take time to have time to myself, time with my own thoughts, time to relax, downtime, things like that. So it's not always work. I tend to be a sort of addicted to productivity at times. So I have to keep reminding myself about that. One other thing that I wanted to talk about because I found it really interesting was we did a section on understanding our shadow. And can we, can we talk a little bit about that shadow side and, and how it can influence us? Sure. Happy to do so. People who haven't studied Jungian psychology or that sort of thing, uh, or read one of the books on the shadow, the shadow is simply a facet of our potential or character that we've disowned. And one example is one of the very, very spiritual young men I've met. They wear all white and they do yoga and they're gentle. And when you shake their hand, they kind of hold your fingers. And it's very kind of passive and soft. Their shadow is their assertive, even aggressive side, because we all have those. Look at any baby and a young child. They have their aggressive side and assertive side, but they, they kind of release their power to being only gentle, only spiritual, only good. And I'm a little suspicious of that. Uh, I think there's some balance in there, having done martial arts and so on. We're all things. So that's some people's shadow side, the more assertive part. Now, there are other people who are only tough. They grow up maybe in less gentle circumstance, and they go, I'm a tough guy or a tough gal, and I'm only tough. But, and they've disowned their nourishing, sensitive, vulnerable side that would complete their character and make them whole. So shadow work is about re-owning. It's about self-knowledge, seeing ourselves realistically, our whole self, not just our self-image. And one might say, well, why, why would anyone want to do that? It can't be that pleasant. Well, not always. Awareness uh, heals, but it's not always pleasant. Um, it's like you see a well, you're looking down a well, and it looks, there's flowers growing around the top of it, the edge, and it looks beautiful. But if you look deep down into the dark part, you see some of the creepy crawlies in there. So we're not talking about Darth Vader or or evil or anything. We're just talking about parts of ourselves that we've disowned. And so it helps us to become whole. We have less self-image to have to defend. It frees our energy and we become more authentic. And that's nothing is more energizing than just, hey, what you see is what you get. You probably notice that. And this isn't hubris on my part, but you probably notice that about me. I'm just here I am, you know, wherever, whoever I meet, wherever I go, I'm the same guy. I'm not playing any roles. I don't need to. Because if someone says, well, Dan, you know, you seem like a nice guy. I, I say, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes this, sometimes that. So th that authenticity is important to me. So that, that's what I would say about the shadow and seeing ourselves realistically. Meditation is one way to do that. And there are others, too, that I, I relate in some of my books. If I could segue for a moment, you mentioned stress. You, you brought that up. Yeah. And, and, you know, in, in many circumstances, we can feel stress. We don't always feel it. Not in every, so we can be kicked back watching a video and, and laughing and maybe we're not feeling a lot of stress then, but we can feel stress in difficult situations. We can also feel stress in family gatherings and happy situations, um, weddings, especially if it's our own, that sort of thing. Stress is a part of life. Uh, I can't help people to never feel, well, actually I can. I think you recall from our, our workshop, I can tell people, I can tell your listeners right now the secret of how to never feel stress again. Yes, please do. <laughs> which is, of course, don't care about anything. <laughs> but that's not altogether a realistic solution. If you want to lead a life that's got a lot of things to it, absolutely not a very realistic solution. <laughs> and I, I love that answer. Dan, let's talk about stress a little bit more because I would love to cover it in a little more detail before the, the clock chimed on me here. Sure. I was just saying tongue in cheek that to not feel any stress in your life, just don't care about anything. But most of us are engaged with life. We do care about things. So stress is a part of life. But when we think deeply about stress, it's just a word. It's a concept. You can't put it in my hand. I can't lay it in yours. It's, it's just an idea of something that feels uncomfortable, that we don't like. And to me, stress is not in our control. It comes and goes. But what is in our control and when we read about the negative effects of stress, what we're really reading about is the negative effects of tension. 
Because when people feel stressed, it affects their breathing. The breathing gets shallow. Their muscles start tensing. Maybe they get headaches and somaticize uh, the tension in various ways. Now, tension as it happens is under our control. We can tense our muscles at will. We can relax them at will. We can take a deep breath at will. So those things are in our control. And you may recall uh, that story I told about a young man who came up to me once after I gave a talk at a university. And he said, Dan, he said, look, I know you do consultations with people occasionally, but they're probably expensive. And I'm a poor college student. What can you tell me for a dollar? (laughs) <laughs> and I, I smiled at him and said, okay, I can tell you six words. You can change your life if you practice. And these six words are here and now, breathe and relax. That's a lifetime practice. We can always focus on that. What is in front of me now? And take a deep breath and relax. And I can tell you this, stress without tension is a pussycat compared to the uh, mountain lion of stress plus tension. So while we're feeling stressed, fine, feel stress. It'll pass. But meanwhile, take a deep breath, shake loose. And that can make a big difference. Absolutely makes a big difference. And in the way of the peaceful warrior, that here and now, breathe and relax, are towards the back of the book, towards the end of the book. And I used to, and I still do, say to myself all the time when I'm in a stressful situation, just reminding myself here and now, to be present, and to breathe through it, breathe through it. And the exhale is where the body relaxes. So lots of long, comfortable exhales, everyone. Yes. One thing we did that was sort of a sideline at the workshop, which was so much fun, was numerology. Now, you have a book, and I apologize, I don't have the title in front of me, but Dan, I'd love to get into that because I was so fascinated by <laughs> your description of how we are based on these, the numbers, as well as some of the other topics you brought up about this idea of numerology. So first, share the title of your book. I apologize, I don't have it in front of me. Oh, sure, sure. Well, the, the, the magnum opus, and more than a million people have read this, is called The Life You Were Born to Live. Uh, and in fact, uh, the title came to my wife and I at the same time we were walking through the living room when our daughters were watching The Sound of Music, and the mother superior was saying to Maria, Maria, you must go out and live the life you were born to live. And we went, that's it. That's the book title. So that book, uh, yes, it is based on numerology. I've never been particularly involved with numerology, but uh, one of my four mentors, a rather unusual teacher, conveyed, there's a longer story, but he conveyed some essential principles in uh, some lectures that I heard with a small group of people. I had 20 pages, small pages of notes, and eventually those pages expanded over the years, over more than a decade, or uh, almost a decade, actually, uh, before I began to um, even contemplate teaching this method. It seems to be more accurate than many forms of, of so-called numerology. It's one aspect of life purpose. I have a small book called The Four Purposes of Life. And just as we divide the days of the year into four seasons and the points on a compass into uh, four primary directions, by looking at our life through the filter of these four purposes, it helps us get a handle on what we're here to do and what we're doing here. So anyone can get a sample, uh, any of your listeners, of what I mean by this life purpose system, which is the third purpose in the book, um, by going to my website, which is peacefulwarrior.com. And they'll see right there on the splash, the homepage, they'll see a life purpose calculator. And if they click on that, it's free. If they click on that, they will immediately just, they can put in their date of birth and they will see some, a sample, a taste of information about their birth number, their life path. And many people find it surprising um, in terms of what it says. So anyone can do that. And they can even look up a relationship dynamic by putting in a significant other's date of birth as well and see what dynamic you make together. So uh, people might enjoy that. So I, I thought I'd mention that on the homepage. Oh, thank you for mentioning it, because it is a lot of fun. We did our numbers in the workshop, and I, yes. I remembered when mine came up. I was like, oh, that is so cool that, mm-hmm. that 
the different numbers that came up were about cooperation and balance and about vision and acceptance and about influence and abundance. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. As we yep. played with that, I enjoyed that. So I encourage everyone to go over to his website, peacefulwarrior.com, and play with it. It's like you said, it's, there's no cost to do it. It's just, just right there on his homepage. Now, Dan, we're just down, um, time flies, but we're just down to the final five minutes. I know there's so much I could have, more I can cover and all of that. Any, what are your final thoughts that you would really like the audience to get? Well, I, I think it has to do with, you know, we talked about to avoid comparison if we can, but another, and also self-trust. And I think uh, a key is we second guess ourselves so much. All of us are looking to live the good life, whatever that means to us. And we lose sight. It's so easy to take for granted the ability to see, to hear, to smell, to touch, to taste, the ability to use our imagination and memory, the ability to uh, play with objects in the world, in this material world, to move, to influence people. So it's easy to take those for granted. And so to, to start to take moments to appreciate all these things, I actually teach a meditation that is about what we let go. One day we will let go of all these things. We'll have to. And so by doing this meditation, it helps us to reinvigorate our sense of opportunity at this life we were given, this rare opportunity. So I think it's important for us to trust the process of our life. It's not meant to be like any others. Our story, each of our stories are unique. There's not a single story on the planet exactly like ours. So by appreciating that, it's our treasure. And it has some moments of heroism, each of our lives. So that's what I think what I would like to leave your listeners with, uh, to, to remember that. Mm. And sometimes... As I'm thinking about after the diagnosis, I felt that the heroic journey was a bit of a mountain climb for a while. And other times I realized now as I'm further down the process that it was all for a reason. It was all for a purpose. And I appreciate being able to have that perspective of seeing oh my gosh, the autoimmune hour and the number of lives that it's changed that I hear from people all the time, including my own, wouldn't have happened. And I, so in a, in a strange way, sometimes people say, don't you want your old life back? I'm like, hmm, no, I don't, not really. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm a much different person than I was before the diagnosis. And I've seen the many blessings of the diagnosis, being able to take what I had from my skill set of communications and nonverbal communication into helping people become stronger self-advocates and become patient advocates for wellness as well. So absolutely. Thank you so much. Yes. Now, Dan, tell us a little bit about some of your books. We have just a couple minutes left, but I want everybody to know um, just a little bit about. Well, I also... Yeah, yeah. And since some of your listeners may be dealing with uh, different challenges, I, I want to remind them also that um, sometimes we even volunteer for adversity. You know, uh, everyone has had physical, emotional, or mental pain in their life of one kind or another. Um, and if we look back on that, we're a little bit stronger and a little bit wiser because of it. So in that sense, we don't have to pretend to like it all the time, but those, those adversities are like spiritual weight training and they make us stronger and wiser. So in a way, every adversity has hidden gifts um, and they connect us with other people in a compassionate way. So, but in terms of, of the various books, you know, anyone can find them at my website, peacefulwarrior.com and see if any of them call out. Um, and I, you know, Jack London once said, it takes hard writing to make easy reading. And I hope you agree, um, having read some of my work, that I, I've worked hard to make the reading engaging and enjoyable, not a struggle to get through. Uh, but in the meantime, people, uh, I offer reminders of what we already know deep down, but we tend to forget. And that's what I'll continue to do uh, as long as I'm able. Mm, and I so appreciate you, Dan, and your, everything you bring to the world. And I want the audience to know I've read his 17 books. And what I love about it is, of course, nonfiction work. And 
What I love about it is so many of the words, it reads like prose. It's easy to read. It's very, it has a way of sitting with you that doesn't feel like you're being heavy handedly taught something, even though it's nonfiction. Right, right. <laughs> I, I appreciate the, the flow and the stories. Dan tells us, you can tell in our t- chat, just our short period of time here, Dan tells marvelous stories and his books and his workshops. See him in person if you get the opportunity. His books and his workshops are just filled with even more delightful stories. Dan, thank you so much for taking the time to share with us here on the Autoimmune Hour. It, it just means so much to us here in the Courage Club community. Oh, what a pleasure. What a pleasure. And I'll, I'll close with one final reminder. A uh, boxing coach, uh, Customato, once said, heroes and cowards feel the same fear. They just respond differently. So your Courage Club folks, are learning how to respond differently. Thank you so much. What a blessing, everyone. Have a wonderful week, whatever your adventures. Join me next week for another episode of the Autoimmune Hour. I so appreciate you all. Thank you. Enjoy. The information provided on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, including the websites understandingautoimmune.com and lifeinterruptedradio.com, plus social media, is for educational purposes only. What you read, hear, and see on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, and its websites, and other media outlets is based on experience only. The information should never be used for any legal, diagnostic, or treatment purposes. Always seek sound legal, medical, and or professional advice regarding any problems, conditions, and any of the recommendations you see, hear, or read here on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio.